Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 56. My name is Alina Warwick, and today we have Y on the show. Before we continue with this episode, I wanted to ask if you can share some love by subscribing to the podcast and leaving a rating. If you leave a rating, your name may be dropped in one of my future episodes. So stay tuned and connected. And get this right. So the first place I actually stayed in was actually in a storage room of an Indian restaurant in Los Altos. And I took the shuttle and then arrived at this restaurant and then he showed me the room. Voila, here it is. It's a dark storage room on the second floor of his restaurant. <laughs> Why grew up in Malaysia and he never imagined that he would live in the United States. He came out to Silicon Valley for an internship doing industrial design. He came with very little belongings and the only spot for him to live in was a storage room that was located on the second floor of a restaurant. He showered at the 24-hour gym and ate at the restaurant for super cheap. He later lived in a trailer in someone's backyard. Because he only had 18 months to figure out his visa situation, every single step of the way, there was a lot of ambiguity. After the company he worked for went under, Y was pushed into entrepreneurship because he had no other choice. Y opened Y Studios, where he innovates and creates new design products for customers like Sonos, the Bluetooth speaker company, and Keen, the hiking shoe company. He's went on to design tablets, digital cameras, coffee makers, all sorts of technology gadgets, razors, and even some gaming controls for Guitar Hero. So let's dive right in and hear all about Y's journey. All right. Why? Thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I truly appreciate your time and I'm so excited to hear all about your journey. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about your immigrant journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to the United States? Okay. Well, I'm from a little island called Penang on the west coast of the peninsula in Malaysia, and I moved here to California in 1996. But I watched through Singapore and Canada before I ended up in California. <laughs> okay, you said Malaysia, right? Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So in 1996, how old were you when you came to the United States? 29. 29. Okay, mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about that journey. What made you leave and go to Singapore, Canada, and then to United States? Yeah, I basically went to Singapore to enroll at a design college. And the original intention was to take up graphic design. It was only in year two that I discovered this wonderful thing called industrial design. And that was 1988. But I couldn't really afford the college. And so I found design internship slash freelance job on a design company. So basically, I dropped out and I worked full time as a legit, I swear to God, industrial designer for about a year and a half. So in total, it's like four years in Canada. By then, my mother remarried a Canadian. And that's how I got to emigrate to Canada and went back to school again. So that was in 1992. Then I repeated the same pattern, right? I couldn't really afford to go back into college. So I did it for about a couple of years, found an internship at Northern Telecom and worked there. Like I finagled a year and a half of internship beyond this summer. So I worked for a year and a half, saved some money, and then got back into school again and finally graduated in 96 and then probably moved to California right after that. So yeah, that's my journey in, a, in short. <laughs> okay. So what do you mean by finagle into the internship? Were you doing yeah. an internship while you were not in school? I was doing an internship and it was supposed to be just for the summer. Okay. Uh, I guess it was 1994. And typically it's only like three months, right? And then I think I was the only person ever that actually asked to like extend it through the next year. Basically, I dropped up from school took up a couple of evening classes, and then finally went back into school again in the fall of 95 and you know did 
whatever is necessary to then graduate in, in April '96. By then, I was already like architecting the next step. Right, I already had an internship lined up in California. So by late May, I was already in Palo Alto in California by '96. Okay, and so what did you study in college? Industrial design. And what was that process like to get into Palo Alto? Did you just apply anywhere in the United States or you just really wanted to be in the Silicon Valley? I really want to be in Silicon Valley. So here's the story, right? So okay. if you were an industrial design student anywhere in the world, you would be like cracking open what's called the ID magazines back then. Back in the days when we had like dead trees and there were magazines, right? Mm -hmm. So you would see a lot of design firms and a lot of like cool stuff coming out. And when you look at a small print, it's always like Palo Alto, San Francisco, Palo Alto, San Francisco. All the design firms are all located there. So I don't know what month it was or what year. I actually flew out and interviewed with a few design companies. And then one of them called GVL offered me an internship, right? But here's the catch, right? They found out that the paperwork to get me in from Canada into the U.S. is going to be so difficult. They actually reneged on their work, right? And this is all done through like paper. They mailed me the offer letter and then they mailed me and said, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. So I got <laughs> super infuriated. So I said to them, look. Why don't we, instead of like trying to get me into Canada this year, I'll do it next year in 96 instead, right? Meanwhile, I will do the homework. I'm going to go find out how to get myself a J1, which is a student exchange program kind of a permit. Mm -hmm. And then once I get that, I'll show up at the doorstep, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you keep that internship opportunity open. So I did that. Like I had to like go find an agency in Toronto and through faxing and phone calls and mailing in paperwork, I got that paperwork done. And yeah, with that, I entered into California in 96 with all those paperwork lined up. So yeah, the J1 allows a student either while you're in school or after you graduate to like to work in the U.S. for experience. For mm -hmm. up to uh, 18 months. So you basically did their homework. And, yeah, and put exactly. Your... I had to do it, right? You gotta, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got that creative mind to just start doing their homework and figure it out and say, you know what, I'll do it, but just keep the internship open. And they did. They were willing to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, awesome. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Malaysia. Oh, boy. It's only in retrospect that think back and you thought, you're thinking, wow, that was quite an amazing place that I left, right? Mm. But back then it's like, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a little island, right? It's 114 square miles. And I looked it up yesterday in preparation for this. So to put it in context, yeah. it's about the same square miles as Tampa, Florida. Oh, okay. And temperature is hovering around constantly at least 85 Fahrenheit, which is around 30 degrees Celsius. Wow. Because it's only a couple of degrees north of the equator, right? So it's very wow. hot and humid tropical country. So yeah, that's put into context. Being Malaysia a country is a very multi-ethnic country. There's the indigenous people, and then there are the Malays, and then... By far, a minority would be the Chinese and Indians, right? So I was already growing up as a minority in Malaysia. And my paternal grandparents were actually immigrant from China. They had to escape the hardship and famine. So they moved to Penang and I'm in Penang. My parents were civil servants. They were both school teachers. So I would say very much like here or worse, they were like lower middle income kind of bracket, right? You, okay. you have a steady income, but you don't have much. Mm -hmm. And honestly, my dad, he just did not know how to take care of money, right? He was, he drank, he gambled and doing all the bad stuff. So my mom was always, always like drumming into me until today, like money is still a, you know, a concern for me. It's like, she's like, uh, we only have so much we can already get by and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the environment where we grew up is pretty 
fascinating because Malaysia is a former British colony, right? Mm-hmm. And it's got a long history of migrants from China, even before my grandparents came, like a couple hundred years ago, maybe three to four years ago. There was a lot of trading, and the trade routes is going through the Straits of Malacca, right? So Dutch, the Portuguese, the Chinese passing through, and mm. each time they do that, they'll leave some folk behind, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of British influence, right? We would drink tea, we had condensed milk, you know, democracy. Wow. Some of the street names were in English. The capital city of Penang is still good old Georgetown, right? Food is super interesting and exotic. It's one of the food capital of the world wow. so today, and it is thriving. Yeah, I mean, I spoke English at home, along with my, the Fukian dialect that my, my folks uh, spoke. Mm-hmm. So, albeit with an accent, of course. So I can't say that it was a hard, right? It's just like very aimless, like as a creative growing up mm-hmm. in a very Asian, resolutely Asian environment. Like your friends were like, oh, I'm going to get into law. I'm going to get into business, economics, accountancy. <laughs> and well, I'm like, uh, I can doodle. I can draw. I don't know what it is. I can draw. <laughs> yeah. So then I had to like, take it upon myself to like figure out what the heck this is all about, right? Which is why I moved to Singapore. And I only could do that because I had relatives already in Singapore. So my dear aunts and uncles kind of like took care of me, right? I would stay in uh, my uncle's apartment. And my, my, you know, so food and lodging were okay, like to get care of. Mm-hmm. I remember my dad saying, son, I only got like 10,000 ringgit, which is equivalent to about $2,000 US. Like, this is all I got. Do what you can with that. So I did that, which is why I had to like drop up from school, work a little bit, save up again, and then continue the journey. But in the end, when I moved to Canada, I had to borrow money from my uncle in order to afford to go back to school again because I just oh, couldn't wow. see it. So why, I got to ask, in Malaysia, Mm -hmm. was it prominent for everyone to seek a higher education? Yeah, being (laughs) typical Chinese family, right? They want you to go to at least tertiary education to be better than what your parents were. And because you are a often minority, it was not easy to, to get into a university, a local university. So a lot of parents like save their whole life to send the kids overseas. Wow. So by the time I got into what is uh, equivalent to high school, a lot of my friends were like, oh, they go to the UK, they go to Ireland, they go to New Zealand, they go to Australia. I'm, I'm like, God, I'm still here. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, so the Singapore was my, my best bet, the only bet I could take on. And I forgot to say that another unique thing about Penang, which I should mention, is that there was an actually an Australian Air Force base in Butterworth on the mainland side of Penang. And I used to listen to Double uh, RRP, the radio RAF broadcast. So, yeah, you hear a lot of English content and an Australian accent. And lots of music were played. And of course, it's all very British kind of uh, bias, right? So, I knew a lot of the typical. And there were a lot of actually Australians living in my neighborhood. So I was already exposed to you know, a foreign culture, so to speak. Right. So growing up, did you always know that you're going to end up in the United States? Not at all. Even no. when I was in Singapore, even when I was in Canada, I had no inkling, right? But the thing is the drive to like move forward with your career and that just try it out and do it. Yeah. Mm. So let's go back to when you were 29 years old, you're in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. What were some of the struggles that you experienced as an immigrant? Yeah, it was not a language as much because, yeah, I mean, it's got a weird accent. And to today, I still have this weird accent. It was more like a cultural and economics kind of a struggle, right? So Palo Alto is basically a server. And I wasn't sure how long this internship was going to be. So mm-hmm. I only brought my bicycle and one suitcase. That was it, right? Wow. Any yeah. savings with you? Yeah, some savings. Just enough to get me into you know, California, right? 
So it was like living with ambiguity for like a year, right? Months and months and months, like not knowing where it's just going to end up, right? And then doing the best you can. And get this, right? So the first place I actually stayed in was actually in a storage room of an Indian restaurant in Los Altos that, what? yeah, that belonged to a family friend, right? So my then girlfriend, now wife, had a family friend who owned that Indian restaurant. So I went and asked him, I said, hey, you know, do you have a place to stay where I can rent for like three months? I don't know, just for a short term. And he's like, yeah. Stay with me. Where's this place again that you're working? Palo Alto? Yeah, yeah. Stay in my restaurant. It says down the street, quote unquote. <laughs> on El Camino. How hard could it be? <laughs> so I'm like, I committed with sight unseen, right? So I showed up with my bicycle still in a box and a suitcase. And I took the shuttle and then arrived at this restaurant. And then he showed me the room. Voila, here it is. It's a dark storage room on the second floor of his restaurant. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I'm like, I mean, dude, it's fine. It's fine. Like, it's a story. I did not feel offended at all. I'm very thankful for him opening his door, so to speak. So how did you shower? How did you prepare <laughs> your food? I there's mean, this, I guess there's this thing called a, a mop sink in the kitchen, right? So no way. there's this little uh, faucet at waist level. And yeah, you're up in a bucket. You sit on it and then you, you know, you shower. You shower. And then across the street, kitty corner from it was, I mean, still is, a 24-hour fitness. So I joined oh, that okay. later. Yeah. And then nearby, there was, and I think it still is, a Walmart. So I got a futon. And then food was kind of free because it was an Indian buffet restaurant. So every morning, I would just pack some leftovers. And that's for lunch. And yeah. yeah, you know, it's just fine. Got by. And how long did you live in that storage? <laughs> Yeah, once I got an inkling of getting somewhere, right, this is past the initial three months internship, I realized, well, maybe this is something. Plus, my friend, Dio Kishore, he probably got tired of me. He's like, dude, you gotta leave. You can't be hanging out here after work, bothering the guests, right? I'm trying to run a business here. So I found a little apartment, a shared apartment. And stayed there for a few months until the roommate kicked me out because I worked late, came home late, and made a lot of noise and all that. So <laughs> I had to move on yet again. So how long were you living in the restaurant? I think three to four months. Oh, yeah. a couple of months. Mm, yeah, wow. yeah. Four months of that and then three to four months of that apartment. And then like half a year, up to a year of... Get this, right? I live in a trailer in the little old lady's backyard in Palo Alto. Wow. So, yeah. So, Sue Harwell was her name. She moved from Arkansas back in the days when Hewlett Packard was just like starting up, right? Mm -hmm. And they moved out west to join the startup thing. And she was saying, yeah, I used to work around a corner in a light bulb factory, blah, 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 in Palo Alto. So anyway, she moved out west in one of those like aluminum trailer. Then okay. she built a house in front of that and the trailer was stuck in the back of the house. So she was renting the trailer out to a like, student from Stanford. And every four years when they graduate, she would pose to the uh, vacancy again, right? So I found it and I looked into it and she's like, I typically rent it out to students. You look all right. So I stayed there for half a year. <laughs> wow. Oh, my goodness. It was fun. I loved it. Things are so <laughs> simple back then. You got a little place to sleep and was close to work. I still had a bicycle. And it was like, life was good. I couldn't complain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And you get by with so little and you mm -hmm. think it's normal and that we get more money and we think we want bigger things and we stick to true. bigger things with more stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I lived frugally all my life. So this is OK. It was like no big deal to me. It's only when you tell people and they go, oh, my God, what? Why, before you tell our listeners about your company, tell me a little bit about the path you took. So I'm hearing you came to Palo Alto. You had 18 months, right, to figure yeah. out your visa situation. Did you get a full-time job after that? Where did you go? Yeah, so GVO, right? So the continuation of the story is that 
it was the next level of finagling, right? So there was somebody senior who left the company. So mm-hmm. I went to the boss and said, look, <laughs> I've been here so many months. And, you know, I'm looking for a full-time job and this guy's left. What about me? What do you think? Right. Mm-hmm. So the conversation evolved to the point where, again, I had to like, let me do the homework. <laughs> so wow. I'm going to be applying for my Canadian citizenship. And when I do get it, I found out that under the NAFTA program back then, you could have like an annual permit called a TN to work in the U.S. as a Canadian, right? So So you didn't even have your Canadian citizenship at this point? It was under application. It wasn't finished, right? Got it. So then I said to him, yeah, it's like, I want to make it as easy for you as possible because I I knew already back then, right? He reneged on his word, right? So it's like, okay, look, this is how it's going to be. What do you think, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it took months, right? Again, a lot of ambiguity. Like, I don't know where this is going to go. Is this going to, you know, there's just a lot of like barriers that had to like overcome in order to get back into the U.S. again. Mm-hmm. But I did all that, right? Became a citizen, got sworn in with thousands of other people, went to the airport in Vancouver, or was it Toronto? I forgot. And then showed my paperwork. And then, yeah, it took some time because... Not every immigrant officer knew how to do this TN thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember like, I got to like get there earlier just so that they can process it. And true enough, the officer was like, yeah, hey, Bob, (laughs) what the hell is this? (laughs) So, oh yeah, this is how you do it. And then, oh, dude, uh," and it's like a lot of like back and forth. And meanwhile, I'm like, holy crap, am I going to get through this or not? (laughs) Yeah, but it was all done. So then the next step was like, okay, showing back up at GBO again. Okay, here you go. As promised, give me the... So it's just done and I got the job. So GBO was the company that you initially had the internship Correct, doing yeah. the, you said, industrial... Design. Okay. Design, yeah. okay, got mm-hmm. it. And then so they got you the full-time job with a Correct. Canadian citizenship. Correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, and then yeah. what happened? And then what happened? And then the next level of difficulty was like, well, TN is only renewable every year. It's not a permanent thing. Okay. So then I had to like convince them that I'm worthy enough to go through the trouble of getting a green card, right? Mm-hmm. So that took a couple of years of convincing, right? And this is all still at GBO. There was like really no other choice. Like the... If you were to go to another firm, you got to do it all over again, right? Mm-hmm. So you had to bet on GBO, and I did. So in order to get a green card, you had to get an H-1B. And to transition from a TN to an H-1B wasn't easy, right? So they had to get a lawyer in, and then the agreement was that GBO would pay the lawyer's fee, And then I had to pay back the fee in installments for my own paycheck. So that was on the process. So I had to pay it monthly and everything. And yeah, it took like two to three years to get into the H-1B and then the green card. Finally got my green card in the middle of... How many years later? Oh my God, like I think two to three years at least. And how long did the whole process take? I believe it was three years. Three years? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad today, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like a lottery system now. Right. So at what point in time did you decide to quit at GVO and start your new business? Or what happened there? Well, Alina, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Another story. Here we go. Yeah. So 2001, right? I. Yes. It was actually, this is the order of events. I got married first, the Lisa, my wife now, in May. And then, only then, I got my green card. And then the dot-com implosion was happening that year, right? Mm-hmm. Then 9-11 happened. And then GVO went under in that order, all within one year. Wow. Yeah. So they crashed and burned sometime in November. 
Wow. And yeah, and by then, right, it was already happening in the beginning of a year where they were declaring like, okay, we're putting everybody, every employee on a part-time basis. You are free to go get any contract work outside of GVO if you can. And so I was very fortunate because Lisa was working at Philips Design at their design studio. And uh, they needed a contractor to help them design a product. And I went and interview, showed my portfolio, and they hired me. So I actually was already contracting at Philips when I got a phone call from a colleague, right? Hey, what are you doing now? Well, you might want to come by and pack up your stuff today because GVO is shutting down completely, wow. right? So that was uh, November. So yeah, that was how I started my company. <laughs> but organically, mm-hmm. there was no other choice. And thank mm-hmm. goodness I had that green card uh, by then. So GVO laid you off, but you had already had, was it a side thing that you were doing with your wife's company? It was a contract work. Okay. Yeah, like a couple of months contract to design a tablet. Yeah, in time for the 2002 CES trade show because the CEO of Philips was going to show off this new tablet design at some keynote speech at the CES in January. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so how long did you do that until you launched Y Studios? So basically, Y Studio started out in November 2001, because that's when I went independent. That's when GBO went under, which is when I went independent, started my own thing. So that's how I started. How old were you when you started your company? I believe I was 34 years old. Okay. Still very young. (laughs) Did you guys have any kids? No, we didn't have no. kids back then. We were very, as you might have noticed, like things were very ambiguous, right? Mm-hmm. We weren't mm-hmm. sure what a lot of instability. We weren't sure where things were going. And first my J1 and then the H1B and then a green card and then dot com implosion and then 9-11. Blah, blah, blah. It's like a lot of like events that got yeah. in the way of planning for it. But yeah, Lisa helped. We're still holding down a job at Philips Design. So she was the breadwinner while I was trying out this solo thing. And so I read in the book, Immigrant Hustle, about your story. And you mentioned that you operated Y Studios from your house for 10 yeah. years. Let me see. First, it was the little bedroom in the apartment and then a bedroom in the house close to the apartment. And then we bought a house in 2005 in San Francisco, and we intentionally purchased an oversized house so that we could operate from home Mm -hmm. and uh, did that for a good five years. So yeah, nine to 10 years of just like running from a home studio. And so did you have employees come to your home office? Yeah. So in 2006, things started growing. And I got tired of like trying to like line up freelancers, right, in anticipation of the next project because it's it's always very, very hard to find the right people at the right time. Oh. And then George came along through an introduction. He just moved out west from Boston looking for some kind of a contract or full time job. So I took him in in two thousand six or seven, I believe. And then he became a full time designer some months after that. So he was my first employee. Yeah. So when I was reading that, I'm like, hmm, sounds like a typical startup. You start off like in a garage or something and there's like yeah. 20 people crammed yeah. in one garage, like doing a oh, startup so business. Bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we did get a lot of contractors and freelancers coming in and out, right? And that's when it got a little bit out of control. You know, the whole uh-huh. house was like crawling with people, spilling out into the living room. Somebody was in the garage banging out mock-ups and models. Yeah. And then that's why in 2010, it's like, it's time to have a more distinct separation of life and work. So that's why we moved out into a studio, separate studio. I love it. Okay. So tell us a little bit about why studios and what you guys do. Mm -hmm. An easy way to explain industrial design, which is what we do, is 
other than fashion or buildings, everything that you touch around you, your furniture, your shoes, your computer, your gadgets, they're all designed by somebody. Mm -hmm. And the profession of that somebody is called industrial design. So, and because we are located in the Silicon Valley, the kinds of products that you design will always tend to be a technology product, right? The new gadget that does this or a new disruptive technology that does that, that does these things better. So then a Industrial designer would have to have some knowledge of both like creativity mm -hmm. as well as engineering and technology. Okay. Who are your main clients or who have you guys served in the past? We were lucky enough to spend like 10 plus years working with a company called Sonos, which makes wireless streaming speakers. Speakers, Yeah. And there are other clients like TiVo, which did a kind of a set-top box that records TV programs onto hard drives in the system. We also spent some years designing a lot of like controllers, game controllers for Activision. So things like Guitar Hero, the guitar controllers, we designed them. Another interesting client would be, I think you guys are familiar with a brand called Keen Footwear. They do a yes. lot of hybrid hybrid sandals. Yeah, so it was actually based in California for a bit. So I did like four years of designing a lot of different shoes for them. Yeah, so that's the kinds of stuff that we do. And then I also saw on your website that you designed a razor for Target. Yeah, it's for a brand called Everyman Jack, and it's based in the Bay Area. We actually did, the first project was actually a packaging system to design the lotions and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And then some years later on, it evolved into, he wants to offer a razor. And initially it was like, I want to have this handle that you can then click on a Gillette cartridge onto it. But then the founder got cold feet because he didn't want to get sued by Gillette, right? Uh -huh. But then he did his own research and found a factory or a company that does their own cartridges their own, their own system and have, have a, a patent on that. So I believe it's like a six-blade cartridge. So we base our design on that particular system instead. Mm. And what nice design per the language that we already pre-established in the packaging, but wanted to have a nice metal finish to it. So the, the, the handle is actually cast for metal. It's not plastic. Mm. So it feels very nice. In the hand. Yeah, you guys are in so many different industries, mm -hmm. which is yeah. awesome. So why I got to ask you, so how does that normally work? So say for Sonos wireless speakers, they hire you and say, we have this grandiose idea of the next lightest weight speaker that is Bluetooth enabled, that's got this feature and that feature. And then they say, go build it or what? How does that process work? Yeah, good question. Typically, a client, when they come to us, like you said, it's an idea, right? Hey, we have this thing, this idea to do X, but we have no idea how the product should look like to appeal to the target audience that we want to sell to, right? Okay. And the design process is typically broken down into four discrete chunks, which is like discover, design, develop, deploy, right? So in the discover phase, you would do some research on the market, what is already out there, how would people use a particular thing, what the pain points are, right? And the tools you would be using could be a myriad of things. It could be like doing ethnography, you could be interviewing the users, you could be doing online research and so on and so on to figure out the data. Right. Mm -hmm. And then only then you would design and to design, you could be sketching, you could be doing 3D modeling, you could be doing 3D printing, anything that you can do to illustrate the idea and show it to the client. Right. 
some clients are happy with like sketches. Some clients like, ah, I can't, drawing to me means nothing. I need to see something in the hand to be able to understand it, right? So we adjust our output according to what is needed. Then ultimately, though, we would then create the final design in CAD, right? Computer-aided design. And there's another piece of documentation called the CMF specification, which is colors, materials, and finishes of the product. So that basically describes like, okay, this surface is this material in this color, this kind of texture, and so on, right? Then it will be sent to engineers for development and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering would get into it. Mm -hmm. And then that file would then be sent to factories to go tooling, and manufacturing and assembly. I know it's like a very basic steps, but that's basically it, like yeah. the process to, to get from A to B. So do you guys have engineers that you guys work with or every single industry has their own engineering process? We don't have engineering people in-house. We would rather subcontract to the expertise that we know about, right? Because this is what I find, like, we don't design the same product every day, right? Sometimes it's, it's shoes, like I said, right? Sometimes mm-hmm. it's a coffee machine. And that requires you to know about fluid dynamics and plumbing and all that. And then the next day you'll be doing a set-top box and you don't need to know that knowledge. You need to know about the basics, mechanical engineering of the enclosure and so on and so on. So we found that like it's better to like get the experts, the right people to do it versus having it all in-house. Plus, a lot of our clients have their own in-house engineers already. Oh, and there was no need for us to bring it on to the table. So who does Apple hire for their design components? <laughs> oh, they have the whole vast ecosystem internally to do all those works. Uh, they're keeping all their secrets inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they never contract, at least for industrial design did never contract their work out. They did do have external engineers, uh, as far as I know, but not design. They, oh. they keep that close to the chest. Okay, so why? How long did it take your business to start seeing some real traction in the beginning stages? I would say within a few months, and only because I wasn't paid very well back then mm-hmm. as an employee. So within the first couple of contracts, I realized, wow, I can do this, right? In a few months time, I can make what I was making in the whole year. Let's continue doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been a series of like discoveries of Lena, like running this business. It's like you find out about yourself and you find out about what you enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of weird for me to say it because I do acknowledge that I am an ambivert, right? I'm my, By default, I'm an introvert. I, I like to just stay quiet and design. Just leave me alone. Just, right? <laughs> but I can, I can flip myself and be very gregarious and talk to people. But I love that, right? I like to meet all kinds of people from all sorts of life. I really enjoy doing that. And I found that I, I'm good at it. Like I can... I didn't know anybody in the U.S. when I first arrived here, right? But I found that I was able to, crazy enough, land projects. I'm like, well, this is interesting. Let's do this. And it just grew from there, like word of mouth, networking, meeting people. It's just like, okay, here's more work. And as soon as you think, okay, this is it. I'm dried up. There's no more. Oh, that's another project. And another project. So did you do any marketing in the beginning stages at all? Or it was just completely networking and word of mouth? It was completely networking. I didn't have an official website till three to four years after I started. Really? Wow. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Who was your first client? Well, I would say officially my first client was Philips Design or Philips oh. in general. Yeah. What did you create for them? So let me explain this Philips, right? So Philips is a Dutch company. It's a multinational, right? Okay. They do a lot of different kinds of products. And they had a satellite studio in Sunnyvale, California, which is where my wife. And that studio behaves 
like a first of all it is a studio that does Philips Designs product, but they also were able to or and allowed to operate as a independent consultancy that service other clientele so long as there's no conflict with Philips product. Right? So the product that I designed was a tablet, which was based on Microsoft's OS. I believe the platform was called Mira, right? This is before iPad came along. <laughs> this is 2001. And yeah, it's like, how does it look like? There were very, very few tablets out there. So we had to take in the technology requirements as outlined by Microsoft, really, and then design around that. So I worked with, I collaborated with another designer who is a Philips employee within the, the studio. And together mm -hmm. we, we came up with the final design. And then I worked, yeah, we together, we worked with the mechanical engineers in-house within Philips. Okay, got it, got it. And then after that, you did networking. Did you go to like meetups or how did you do the networking back then? So um, I also collaborated with a mechanical engineer that was also at GBO. And he brought in Fujitsu, which had a development department back then. Okay. So we did kind of an accessory for their version of tablet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and wasn't that many meetups it was just really like word of mouth mm -hmm. and chance meeting of certain people that you get the next project i'll tell you a crazy thing right this yeah. is a very very funny story so another ex-colleague from phillips he bought a house and by then he's already joined apple right and he had a housewarming party so we went like because we knew them right we, we mm -hmm. went and, and Nothing happened. Tony <laughs> Fidel showed up. The godfather of the iPod showed up because he too used to work at Philips. What? I know. I mean, we said hello, but never talked more beyond hello, right? So he doesn't know who I am. So, you know, relax. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then I, in my conversation with one guy, it turns out that he's like a sales director at a shoe company called AD1. And he's like, yeah, we were doing some skateboarding shoes and we're actually looking for designers. Why don't you come in and go come talk to my CEO? Maybe there's something. So I arranged for a meeting and I showed up and they're like, yeah, can you show us some sketches? I'm like, I've never done shoes before, right? <laughs> so I doodled something and it's like, this is why I think I want to do this. Way. And they're like, great, you're hired. I'm like, what? Really? Well, we want to have fresh eyes. We don't want to have the same old shoe designer cranking out shoes again. I'm, I'm probably very affordable. That's probably the reason why they hired me, right? So I did, I did skateboarding shoes. I don't skate <laughs> at all. Wow. So you sketched it in front of them. I did it like the day before and I scanned it, Photoshop and cleaned it up and then printed it out and showed it to them during Oh, the got it. Yeah. But it worked out. We went to Korea to work with the shoe developer and then the CEO. Another crazy story, Alina. This yes. is like this is why I love what I do, right? So the yes. name the name AD1 is the founder is actually Adi Dassler Jr. Does okay. that name sound familiar to you? No. Mm -mm. Adi Dassler Jr. is the grandson of Adi Dassler who is know. the founder of Adidas. No way. Crazy. What? Yeah. Wait a second. You met... I never met Adidas. Oh, okay. I never met Adidas. But he was in the background. I work only with the sales director and the CEO. But Adidas was the guy funding the, uh, the company. Crazy, right? I think he went to school in like Menlo College and ended up staying put and wanted to have some kind of like a shoe company legacy. So we started 81 some years before then and so on and so on and so on, all the folklore. And then the CEO liked my work and now saying and said, let me introduce you to some guys. They're shining out a company and the founder turned out to be the co-founder of the Keen's footwear brand. And he was based in Menlo Park, right? Uh... So uh, this is how I got like engaged to do like 
shoe collections. When I met him, this, his name is Rory First. He had already had one model selling. It's called the Newport. It's still selling, right? A Newport hybrid sandal. Okay. And I think REI had some orders and he gained traction pretty fast, right? And then he had to fill in the categories like, okay, what else you got? Okay, <laughs> shoes. So pretty soon they were like, well, we need to get people to design all these other shoes alongside to the collection, right? So yeah, I, I was roped in to do this and that and spent four or five years with them doing shoes. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so well, I got to ask you, do you get any like discounts at all these companies that you designed for? <laughs> I did. I did. I had discount with uh, Keen. So I was, I kept buying shoes and <laughs> yeah, I mean, 30% off, right? And then, yeah, okay. and okay. then the owner of that brand also acquired the brand called Chrome, Chrome Bags, right? Uh-huh. So I did some Chrome shoes too. And through that, I also got some discounts. So I bought a lot of Chrome gear and and then Sonos too, right? My house and my office is just full of Sonos product. Mostly engineering prototype. They work well, but they're not final production, but they work well enough that I still have them. Mm, got it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's nice that they take care of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. So why it seems like you didn't have to raise any capital to start your business. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, correct. You basically did that at your house. Yeah, computer. I think I purchased it from GBO. And I bought a, a bandsaw from another ex-colleague of mine, installed it in the garage, basically bootstrapped it. Yeah. And what about mentors? Did you have any mentors to help you out to start your business initially? Yeah, that's the one thing. If there's any regrets in my life, is that one thing. I did not get any mentors, right? Because I the one the people that I wanted to talk to to figure out this crazy game are competitors. Right. Mm. So you can't be like, hey, Mr. Like, how do you do this? Give yeah, me your secret teaching. sauce. <laughs> why, yeah. why would they? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to like learn from mistakes and just like you fall and you pick yourself up and you keep going again, again, again. But I do have mentors now that is they are either retired or in an adjacent industry or the VCs, right? So there are a few of them, like a handful of them that I go talk to when I'm in trouble or when I need to unlock a problem. When you're in trouble. When I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so did you find them through getting plugged into like entrepreneur organizations or where did you find these mentors? If so, it's organic. Yeah, that one guy, like I'm going to name names here. Hopefully he won't kill me. <laughs> Charles Huang, he and his brother Kai Huang were the co-founders of Red Octane, which is a company that did the game controllers. Okay. They got acquired by Activision, which is how I got involved with them, right? Like doing this game, game controllers. So they got acquired by Red Octane. I continued working with Activision and somehow we still stayed in touch as well as stay in touch with a lot of like ex employees at Activision, right? So mm -hmm. I look to him sometimes for advice. It's like because he's a VC now, like Mr. Money Man, what you do kind of yeah. thing, right? What's yeah. happening in industry? How come things are so slow these days? <laughs> kind of thing. But another great thing coming out of that, right, is that I get to introduce him to clients of mine. So Mm -hmm. That's the massive upside, right? So, for example, he is investing in a company called Audios, which is my client. And then just last week, also through my introduction, he is investing in another one of my clients' uh, company as well. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I love being able to like, connect people together mm -hmm. and have great outcomes from that. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of whole rash of people around me that is supportive of what I do, right? Yeah, I look, I look to them for all this advice. And I have a, an old colleague called Ray McKinnon. He was a senior designer. He's retired now. He's like an uncle to me. So yeah. I'm hearing it's very important to reach out and find mentors. I think so, you know? for sure. Like that's one thing I should have like put more effort into it to get mentors and do it on a regular basis mm -hmm. versus going to them only when I'm in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because an entrepreneurial path can be a very solo oh my gosh. path. Yeah. And, and if, yeah. if we're running this solo, like you said, when we have questions, where do we go? We yeah. can't go to the competitors, like you said. They're not going to give a secret. So, yeah, it's so, so important. And thank you for sharing that and refreshing yeah. our memories that, yeah, it's so important to yeah. reach out and network as much as possible and to continue those relationships as well and not only mm-hmm. just to reach out when we're in need. So that's awesome. I love it. And then I got to say, like some people, some of these folks, they don't know they are mentoring to me, right? They just see themselves as like a friend or uncle or brother to me or an aunt for that matter, right? It's like here. Yeah. But I look to them consciously sometimes as mentors. Like I got to like solve this problem. What should I do next? That kind of stuff. Yeah, I call those invisible mentors. They're in our lives, yeah. but they don't know that they're mentors to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a long list of them now. Yeah. So. Okay, so why? I got to ask you, how do you reinvest in yourself? Because this market is so ever-changing. Oh, oh, how man. do you stay up to date? The good thing about my industry is that it is always in a state of flux is always in a state of reinvention right okay. no matter what you'll have to keep up it's either you keep up or you get out of the way right yeah. so you gotta like keep learning new tools new software that's the easy one right no matter what there's always new stuff you gotta learn new techniques of getting business in you have to know about things beyond just the classic industrial design. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I'm a little bit of a weirdo in that I'm also doing a lot of like two-dimensional graphic design, branding kind of stuff. Okay. UX, UI stuff. So I make sure that I am versatile. At first, it's twofold, right? First is I just like designing. And I actually went to college in Singapore at first to enroll into graphic design before mm-hmm. I actually stumbled into industrial design for one thing. Mm-hmm. So I like to like be multidisciplinary like that. Mm-hmm. And it has served me well, right? System of two things. It's like it helps keep the light on. It helps pay the rent. Mm-hmm. So I just like doing that. And fast forward to today, now I find myself able to provide services beyond just ID to my client, right? I'm helping them do branding. I'm helping them do a bit of UX, UI, right? I'm helping mm-hmm. them do a packaging, helping them think about themselves. Like, what is your brand story? What is your value? Why are you here? The who, the what, the why, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm doing that just now. Like, we redid the industrial design last year, and now we've evolved our engagement into doing branding for this one client like that. It's fun. I love it. Yeah, yeah. But right now, do you read like books on it to keep up to date? Or are you on Forbes reading through the next new thing that's going to be up in the market? Or how do yeah, you? Yeah, do- I'm constantly absorbing, right? Or trying to absorb, right? Okay. Reading up about branding, how you do it, what's the framework to do it, reading up about marketing, how a particular company should behave and how would they tell the world about themselves. So there's a lot to learn. It's never ending, right? Right, right. And I thrive on that. Like, I can just do this until I drop dead. And yeah. <laughs> I'll still not learn enough. You know what I mean? But nowadays, after working beyond all these different things, right? I find that it's a bit too narrow-minded to call ourselves just industrial design. You're actually helping a client deliver experiences to their users, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to deliver the experiences, it encompasses everything. The journey of how they engage with you in the first place, how do they know about you, what you as a company have to tell them or show them Right. And that would be that the website, social media. Right. And then when they order, either they purchase it from the shop or buy it online. Well, the physicality of the packaging, Mm -hmm. the information and the messaging on the packaging, how the unboxing feels like. Right. Mm -hmm. Before you even like take their product out and turn it on. All those things have to be already thought of. And then, only then, then you look at the industrial design, 
you turn it on, and then, oh, yeah, there's a setup process. Oh, yeah, there's a software app. Oh, you got to go online to register, da, 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 right? <laughs> and then after that, I was like, okay, how do I maintain it? How do I update it? When I run into trouble, who do I go to? Do I go to the website, chat with some bot? Is it a real person? Is this some guy overseas? Is it a bot, right? Mm-hmm. What kind of experience is like? So everything, like the whole thing is designed. Wow. And that's what I try for. Thank you so much for sharing that because a lot of people listening and myself included, I, for one, did not know that Keen Sandals was not designed by Keen Sandals. <laughs> well, they probably have like in-house team now, but back then they didn't have anybody in-house. It's like a, a whole, whole bunch of people beyond me like doing this and that. Yeah, it's just yeah. for me. But it still happens to this day. A lot of companies are using folks like yourselves to outsource for a fresh set of eyes and to have something new and innovative because, Mm -hmm. yeah, I had no idea that the big companies are, well, I guess in the beginning they were kind of smaller, but Sonos is pretty big. And look Mm -hmm. at that. You were able to design some of their products too. So that's absolutely amazing and so, so powerful that you're able to do that. So I got to ask, what does the American dream mean to you? I actually did not approach what I did as the American dream, right? When I set up my little studio, I never thought of it as like trying to achieve the dream or trying to make money, right? But it's more like having to make lemonade when life gave me lemons, right? Right. Or survive by any means to get by, but the growth from that is like, really, hey, I gotta do this for a living. This thing that I love so much about in this cool place in California and make a go of it. Yeah, I'll do it, let's do it. So 20 years later, I'm still doing that. So have I achieved my dream? Yes, I have, I guess. Like when I was hiring Eric, my design director, I'm like, Dude, I think I have achieved my dream. If you're measuring it by, have I set up a studio? Have I managed to hang on and stay on in California? Yes. Have I hired crazy sounding, but hired Americans to work with me? Yes. Have I had a chance to work with all kinds of people in the US, Canada, Europe, and China? Yes. Have I purchased a warehouse? former studio? Yes, I have. Right? So Mm -hmm. check, 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 check. But it is a slog. It's super hard, I feel, to hang on to the dream because it's hard work. Every single day you wake up, it's like, oh, there's just like lists of things to do, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the things you love to do and some of the things is like, yeah, okay, I'll do it because you have to, right? Mm -hmm. And some days you thrive on that. Some days you'd rather go, doesn't want to hide I know, and not face <laughs> the world. Such is life, I guess. Yeah. Do you think anyone can reach their American dream? I think so. I believe it is possible. Mm-hmm. For all the racism and the odds stacked against an immigrant, I think the U.S. can somewhat thrive on meritocracy, right? Mm -hmm. If you do work hard, you can indeed unlock success the way you want to measure it, right? Setting up a business is not hard. You can do it online now, right? Paperwork is just like, it's not hard. But I would say to people too, is like, go at your own speed, right? Mm -hmm. But be ready to change on a, turn on a dime, Don't expect things to turn out the way you want to turn out and be ready to embrace opportunities and changes when you run into it, right? Hmm. But there are those, right, opportunities out there. And if you keep at it, you are going to be new doors opening up. And now I'll give you an example, right? Yeah. If you look at a world map, I've been going west, right, west to Canada and keep going, you know, Ottawa, west to California. (laughs) And then... But then I find myself like going west to come back east again because I've got clients in China now, right? 
that wants to sell products online to the U.S. market. And it's a full circle. Yeah. And if you ask me back in 20, I started working with them in 2015. If you ask me in 2010, like I wouldn't have thought of that possibility. But I seeked out the opportunities and you know, stayed in that uh, category. And now we work with Chinese companies and it's not easy, right? I only know a bit of Mandarin. So there is that language barrier. I know a bit of the culture, so there is that cultural somewhat barrier. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like a learning opportunity. It's like, okay, well, now I am incentivized to finally pick up my Mandarin. And now I have an excuse to go to China and find out about the people from there, where my ancestors come from, right? To me, it's interesting. So Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like, it's great. Yeah, so powerful. Thank you so much for dropping all that wise advice for us. I wanted to ask you, is giving back either volunteering time or giving back to the community something that is part of your business values? It should be, and I know that I should be doing more of that. I have, to be honest, been hunkering down, heads down, trying to keep this business alive, right? We're working on on projects and stuff. But when I have time to, I do try to mentor students. Right. I actually signed up to a school to to yeah, mentor a couple of students. And when I have a chance to not Stanford, I believe it was who was it? There was a couple of students from San Jose State back in the days. And then I had an intern from the Academy of Art and so on and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just like come to me straight up as a mentor student thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come to me and they intern for me, right? And there was a year when we were mentoring a couple of high school kids, right? One one kid wanted to, he wants to go to college too because he wants to design shoes. And then another kid was like trying to figure out, should I take up design or engineering? So we had them over for the summer and we give them projects, fake projects, right? Mm -hmm. To sweat them out and make them work uh, like a real world project. Wow. So yeah, so that was fun. But it takes management. It takes time away from what you're doing. And when I don't have time, I had to choose, right? I had to pick. So I had to focus on my uh, on, on my business. Yeah. And hopefully you'll be able to open up a mentor program through your business and be able to help and mentor all these high school kids, college kids to dream big. It'll be lovely, right? When I yeah. do, if and when I do semi-retire, to give back by that, like give classes or yeah. coach them or, or mentor them. And right now I do speaking engagements, right? Once in a while when, when people come to me mm-hmm. or I was invited by me and my wife, we were invited by Samsung America to talk about design and culture and stuff a couple of years back. So you've been in business for 20 years. What's next for you guys? What are some business goals for the next couple of years? Congratulations, by the way. It's a milestone. I cannot believe it myself either. Yeah. What's next? Well, continuing in this vein, because it is a rich vein to Mm -hmm. tap into, Uh but evolving to offer a wider kind of creative services to my client, right? So as I mentioned, right, I think we should be providing experience design versus to siloed into industrial design, Mm -hmm. right? And this is true of almost every industry out there. What can be automated should be automated. What can be digitized should be digitized. And what can be done remotely should be done remotely, right? Mm -hmm. So for that, we are trying to do that, like go as virtual as possible, have an ecosystem of resources around the world, not Mm -hmm. just here in California or the Bay Area, and then put together a team to do X, right? Whatever that X might be. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful dream, Alina, would be like to be a nomadic designer, right? be remote working, inputting on this topic yeah. or this subject matter or solving this problem, wherever the hell you want to be. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. That will be awesome. Right? You'll get there. 
I know you will. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of already doing there, right? Like, it's like I am in San Francisco, where a lot of people want to be, right? So every day, it's almost like a staycation for me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, you get to walk in the neighborhoods, appreciate nature and city life. I go surf every weekend. I can get to surf every weekend. Wow. Amazing, amazing stories. Thank you so much for sharing that. What are some things you would advise the next aspiring immigrant that wants to start their own business? Yeah, I wrote it down too, that it is possible still, that it is achievable, but do go at your own speed. Do go find support. Made it a conscious effort. Do go find like-minded people. Surround yourself with like-minded people. And it's true for everybody, right? Because if they're not like-minded, it's just going to hold you back. Mm-hmm. Stay focused, like I said, but be willing to change. Mm-hmm. And what do we do with our broken English accents? Get a dialect coach. No, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think you should do what your dad did, right? Take classes, talk, have dialogues, and just learn it. Practice makes perfect. It's the same as me trying to relearn Mandarin, right? It's when a Chinese Malaysian speak Mandarin, they have an accent, very mm-hmm. deep accent. They can mm-hmm. just like go, ah, you're not from China, right? Yeah. And then compounded by me not being fluent at it, right? So now when I'm really Mandarin, I was taking classes by Skype with a teacher in China, for example. Wow. So, and plus working with Chinese factories and Chinese clients, my accents is, I think, evolving into the mainland Chinese accent. Mm. Or certain words, right? But yeah, it will always, I'm sure, it's always going to be like overshadowed by by Malaysian but you do your best. Yeah. And basically what I'm hearing is go and get tutors or go and teach yourself. Go in. There's so many online courses that anybody yeah. can pick up and start learning a brand new language or brand new talent mm-hmm. or something else that it's so easy and accessible really? these days that... You have no excuse. You have no right. excuse. Well, why? Thank you so much for coming on the show. I truly appreciate this conversation. I had an amazing time learning all about industrial design and all about the amazing work that you do out there. And I hope to see a lot more awesome and cool designs from you you in the next couple of years. So I wish you all the best of successes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, Alina. I really appreciate it. Alrighty, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a review wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.